In the name of Jesus, amen. Have you seen those uh, before and after TV ads? We hear the testimonials of people, their lives change forever because they got started on the right business or the right diet or the right medical program. I was in debt, barely scraping by, and then I got the uh, get rich quick scheme and then everything was fine. You've seen those. Or the lose weight or the get heal uh, quickly commercial. If you get the right kind of water or whatever, right? You've seen the before and after pictures. Before, bad. After, great, right? Who wouldn't want to do this? This would be great stuff. Now, some of these programs could be legitimate and helpful uh, for some, and others are schemes that just promise too much and deliver too little, playing often with people's emotions and giving them false hope. Whether good or bad, what I find kind of interesting about this before and after commercials is that they only kind of tell you the good stories but they never tell you what happens between <laughs> the before and the after. They only give you the successful stories. And I often wonder when I look at those commercials, what about those in between? <laughs> what about those who struggle? What about the struggles of people who wanted to and tried everything to save enough money for a rainy day, to lose weight, to get healthier, but just couldn't seem to get anywhere. What about the ones who are still trying to make ends meet, managing the way, coping with illnesses, all that post-pandemic after effects stuff, the Zoom fatigue and the depression or the isolation or whatever it is. What about the ones who never get their after picture taken. You know, the Bible also has a before and after picture. The before picture is what is called the old age, the world under the influence of sin and death and illness and evil, bad. And then you have an after picture. It's not a humanly made, picture through some kind of, you know, scheme or whatever that we design, but it is God's after picture, and it's a beautiful picture. It's a picture of paradise restored. It's a picture of eternal communion with God. It's a picture of a world with no more sin, sickness, death, and evil. But the Bible also talks a lot about that time between the before and the after. The time in which we live, actually, now. And that time between is not pretty all the time. It is full of struggle. And the Bible depicts it in quite realistic ways. If you think about the Old Testament reading from Isaiah, for instance, the prophet describes God's people as a people covered in ashes, in mourning, with a faint spirit, a people living in shame, dishonored at the hands of their enemies, their cities ruined, devastated for generations. Not a pretty picture. And in the Gospel reading, Jesus essentially tells his disciples, my trials are your trials. Really, I thought that hanging out with Jesus was cool all the time. Well, <laughs> there are difficulties also that come along. Those who follow him will also suffer for his sake. Not exactly the prettiest picture that you can find. And in the epistle reading, boy, that's another one. Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh, perhaps a chronic illness of some sort that he had to struggle through, 
or perhaps afflictions that he suffered constantly in his ministry of preaching Christ. Whatever the thorn in the flesh was, it does not sound good. Last time I had a thorn in the flesh, it was not pretty. <laughs> not a pleasant experience at all. And it certainly did not make Paul's life easy. It was a struggle for him. Even though the Lord helped him through it, and in fact the Lord used Paul mightily, even in his weaknesses, to bless many people. Now, I don't want to be a party pooper here today. <laughs> there are indeed many beautiful experiences in this life, beautiful moments in this life. Thanks be to God. In between the before and the after, between the old and the new, yes, there are many moments when God showers us richly with his blessings. And even, I would say, give us a little peek into heaven. A little peek into a restored new heaven and earth. Think about this for a moment. When your sins are forgiven, we get a little peek into God's after picture, into his future, into a world where there will be no more sin. A world in which we will not sin against God, we will not sin against each other. All is restored, all is forgotten, all is forgiven forever. And we get a little peek of that. Heaven on earth, right now, when sins are forgiven. Or think about this, when we're healed of our sicknesses, even there we get a peek into a world, into God's after pictures, when there will be no more sickness, no more diseases, no more ailments, no more death. I often think of sickness as a sort of announcement of death, that things are not right, that eventually we die. But when we are healed, we get that little peak. Think about when, triumph, when good triumphs over evil. We get a peek into a new creation, God's after picture, when there will be no more evil. And all things will be made right. And when we eat and drink Christ's body and blood in communion, which we will do just, in just a little bit, we get a little peek into that kingdom that Christ is talking about in the gospel reading for today. When his servants will recline at table with him and have everlasting communion in an awesome banquet at the last day heavenly banquet in the new creation. And we get a little taste, literally, a little taste of that right here in the between. Paul himself experienced a very interesting kind of strange uh, <laughs> thing. And we see it in the epistle reading for today, this business about being caught up into a third heaven. What is that? Paul doesn't even know what the heck happened to him. <laughs> but he talks about it. He talks about, you know, getting caught up in paradise, he says. And this is such an extraordinary experience. He doesn't even know if he experienced it in the body or out of the body. What kind of experience was this? Was it a vision? Was he literally taken up into heaven? Who knows? But it happened. And it must have been a wonderful thing. You know, but what's interesting is that Paul doesn't dwell on that experience. He says, you know, it's not my time yet. Christ still wants me here. He wants me to live in the between. <laughs> he doesn't want to make a big deal out of this awesome experience, this strange and wonderful revelation. He does not want the experience to go to his head, you might say. To make him conceited and proud. But rather he wants to focus on Christ. He doesn't want the peek into God's paradise to become a distraction from what is going on in the time between. When he suffers affliction, but not without 
Christ giving him grace and strength to go on and do the ministry that Christ himself called him to. You know, if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that life in this world is tough. That there is no paradise on earth that we can build with our own hands. Instead, we live in between the old and the new, the before and the after. And in that between time, we experience pain and sorrow, the before. But also, we get to experience God's grace and strength and care, mercy, love, right in the midst of it all. And in that way, we get those peaks of the after. You know, those are signs of God's after picture, even now. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Of how life between the old and the new looks like. Last Sunday, I got an unexpected email from a beautiful couple I married in California back in 2004. I had to go back and say, is it 2014 or four? No, it was that long ago. A wonderful Filipino couple. High school sweethearts, big smile. What a day that was. The whole premarital counseling journey with them, beautiful, wonderful. In any case, the bride explained to me how they were watching a video of their wedding. Uh, back when I was half the size of the man I am now. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they were watching this video, and they were reminiscing how beautiful that day was. How beautiful everything was. It's like a picture of heaven on earth of Christ, the groom, his bride, the church, right? So her husband asked her to find out where Pastor Leo was. If you can find his last email or whatever, try to find out where he was. So she started Googling, and she said, you know, uh, Pastor Leo, it wasn't that hard to find you. You know, there are too many Leopoldo Sanchez's working in the Lutheran church. And she was able to find my email at work, and that's how she got in contact with me. And she did it because the husband said, find Pastor Leo, so we can say hi to him. And then she dropped the bad news. Her hubby had been struggling with cancer for a number of years now, and the cancer has now become terminal. He's now on palliative care. And they live day, day by day, not knowing what's going to happen next, and only knowing that Christ is their strength in sickness and in health. Well, he wanted me to pray for them. And this is what really, really got to me. After sharing all the struggles, here's what she wrote, and I quote, We thank the Lord every morning when my sweetheart wakes and thank him at the end of the day for blessing my sweetheart with another day. The Lord is our strength. End quote. When I read that, it was like reading Paul in the epistle for today. Paul says that his thorn in the flesh his afflictions, while not pleasant, have made him completely dependent on the Lord, thankful for the Lord's presence and care, even in tough times. His struggles taught him to rely on the Lord in good and trying times for this couple in sickness and in health. In that time between the old and the new, however, in that between time, Paul and this couple they know Paul was not alone. The couple was not alone. They knew Christ was with them. The Lord told Paul, My grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul responded, When I am weak, I am strong. Why? Because, he adds, the power of Christ rests upon me. 
What a testimony, this couple, you know. So how do we live in that between time, between before and after, between the painful and the hopeful? Well, first, as we learn from Paul and this couple, we hang in there. We hang in there. We depend on, we trust in the Lord, we rely on His grace and strength in trying times. We pray for His protection and His care to get us through, just like Paul did, just like the couple from California does. From them, we learn that Christ's power comes, shines through in our weaknesses. God can use our struggles to make us resilient and to make us humble and thankful. And because Christ lives in us and is with us, when we are weak, we are strong. So let me ask you something. What is your thorn in the flesh? What afflicts you right now? What struggles are you facing? To you, Christ says today, my grace is yours. I am your strength. Rely on me. How else do we live in this time between the before, the painful before, and the hopeful, glorious after? Well, in the Gospel reading, we learn another way in which we do that. We learn from Jesus to be a servant. To be like Him. A disciple should not boast about who is the greater one among them. A disciple should not boast of whatever power, authority, influence God has given him. Instead, what he does, or she does, is they use their ministries and vocations to serve others. And this is exactly what Paul does, doesn't he? He doesn't boast in his great spiritual experience in the third heaven. Instead, he focuses on the work Christ is doing in and through him, even in his afflictions, to bless many with the word of God. And it's because that gospel goes out to the Gentiles that you and I are sitting here today, worshiping the Christ whom Paul and his associates and those who came before him preach to the ends of the earth. The couple in California called me because the husband had requested that Pastor Leo serve them in these difficult times. To share God's word. To pray for them. Was it easy? It wasn't easy for me. It's tough to walk along beside people who suffer and who are seeing the end coming soon. But it's almost as if they were saying, you know, you were with us when we started life in Christ in marriage, and so now we need you to serve us now as our life as a couple seems to be coming to an end. To walk along with people in their struggles is a difficult and humbling way to serve others. And here Jesus is our greatest example, isn't he? For as Paul himself explained somewhere else, Jesus was in the form of God, yet he did not boast about being God. Instead, he took the form of the servant, says Paul, all the way to the cross in order to save us. Here Christ's power comes or is revealed through weakness, through the cross, through service, through sacrifice, and the same is true for us. Paul uh, Luther, I should say, has this wonderful sermon where he says, we should set aside the God attitude, you know, like having attitude. That's the wrong attitude to have. Because you're not even God. And Christ, who is God, doesn't even have that attitude. So stop it. And instead, take on the servant attitude. That is the attitude that we have been called to exercise. So let me ask you this. What power do you have what wisdom, what authority has been given to you? What influence do you have? What means, what resources are at your disposal? 
how might the Lord be leading you to use those to serve others? Especially those under affliction, those who mourn, those who struggle. How do you become a little Christ, a servant to them? How else do we live in this time between the painful and the glorious after? Another way to do so is to simply tell the story of God's plans for this world, for his creation in Christ, to people. We all know the before picture is bad, right? Everybody knows this. Sin, brokenness, shame, evil, death, all around us, we know. But the best part of the story is God's after picture. And how God gives us a picture of what's coming, of the new creation, even now. The, that peak of heaven on earth in this time between. People are looking for this story. And the reading from Isaiah, read by our brother Dick here, and thank you for serving us in this way, brother, is a wonderful sample of storytelling. Because there we see how God promises to send the Messiah, Jesus, to the world to comfort those who mourn. He will bring good news to the poor, bind the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, proclaim the Lord's favor and mercy to his suffering people. He will comfort all who suffer. Through Jesus, God will rescue us. He will reverse our bad fortunes and give us eternal blessings. Heaven on earth are ready with Jesus' first coming into the world. And now the mourner with ashes and with a faint spirit will become one who celebrates with a beautiful headdress, smelling like costly oil, wearing a garment of praise. I mean, this sounds like a funeral that has turned into a wedding celebration. And through the Messiah, God will turn his people's shame into honor, will turn the faint into oaks of righteousness, sturdy. Their ruined and devastated lives will be built up, raised up. The prophet Isaiah gives us this promise. Instead of your shame, there will be a double portion of goodies. Instead of dishonor, you shall rejoice in your lot. You shall have everlasting joy. Now, these are God's wonderful after pictures, right? Heaven on earth when Christ returns in his glory that second time at the last day to make all things right. And finally, in the Gospel reading, Jesus himself also gives us a picture of God's after. He gives it to the, his disciples and to us today. Yes, between, before and after, you will go through trials. It will not be easy. But in the new creation, I will give you, says Jesus, a kingdom and you will sit on thrones and you will rule with me and you will eat and drink and recline at my table in my coming kingdom. You will be rewarded, servants, with a great, big, awesome fiesta. And as you journey through life, between the before and after. Keep that fiesta in mind. Remember that that between time might not be easy, but it is always, even now, filled with God's grace and strength. So let God's after picture give you comfort and strength and hope, even in the here and now, as you await that day when our enemies Sin, death, and the devil will be completely destroyed. Christ is with you. In his name, amen.